We're going to start chapter 16 today. Chapter 16 deals with acids and uh, bases. That's a long topic, so it's split up into two chapters. Chapter 16, chapter 17. Chapter 16, part one of acids and bases. Uh, for acids and bases, let's just start off with pure water at um, 25 degrees C. Um, Pure water at 25 degrees C, we can look at the uh, kinetic energy distribution. Not all water molecules are going to have the same energy. In fact, there's going to be a distribution. Um, if you look at the kinetic energy here, EK. Uh, what does that distribution look like? Yeah, so this is Boltzmann thermal distribution, something like that. It turns out that there's going to be a, a small fraction of molecules. Let's say this is a cutoff here. Okay, molecules with, with a higher energy than this particular cutoff will have uh, enough energy to, to actually react uh, or to break bonds. And so, uh, what happens here is that we'll have an H2O plus an H2O <coughs> collide with so much force that we have proton transfer occur. In other words, there's an acid base, bronze acid acid base reaction. And so here we're going from um, weaker, you know, this, is, this would be the weaker acids, this would be the weaker base, this would be the weaker acid. And the conjugates here, this would be the stronger acid, this would be the stronger base. And so for sure there's no driving force for this. Right. And this uh, reaction is heavily favored to the left uh, for the reactants. And so we would say like no reaction. You know? In chem 1A we would say no reaction because there's no driving force. But when we look at it in more detail, uh, the thing is, at 25 degrees C, you can't stop the molecules. And so there's going to be a small, high you know, energy fraction. This, this amounts to about four out of a billion. So if I have a billion population, about you know, four water molecules will have sufficient energy to, to react in this way. It's, this is not a stable combination. Obviously, this is going to be highly reactive. We've got strong acid, strong base. They're going to neutralize each other and go back. And so we, we know that this, delta G is going to be quite positive for this. Right? Delta G should be significantly above zero. And K should be very small. Right? K should be much, much less than one. You know, other than. And, uh, and uh, so it's non-spontaneous. However, uh, it happens. It happens naturally in pure water. And uh, this would be a little am animation of that. Although this, this animation, I wish they'd speed it up. Because this is really slow motion here. Let's see. And so here's the, uh, here is the uh, reaction. And here's the little animation that they have here. You see, you see the hydrogen bonding interactions there. But, you know, it's not like every single water molecule in the population has enough energy to, to break bonds like this and form bonds. Something. All right, this is, you know, we could think of this in terms of Bronsted Lowry, or we could think of this in terms of acid base. Um, uh, Lewis acid base, sorry. With the Lewis acid base, you know, a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. And a Lewis acid would be an electron pair acceptor. And so the way this would work is, is something like this. You would have this uh, lone pair here. This lone pair would be an sp3 orbital. This sp3 orbital would push into this s orbital. And this, in terms of valence bond theory, this would be an s sp3 sigma bond. And so if we have sp3s overlap here, it's going to kick these out onto the oxygen. What we end up with is this. Again, this is heavily favored to the left. There are different ways of, of showing it heavily favored to the left. 
you know, in, in true equilibrium, you know, the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal. This is not to show unequal rates. This is just to show that it's favored to, to the left. But um, normally we just show equal arrows like this and then just show K value or delta G value to indicate which direction it goes. Now the, the oxygen here is going to have a positive formal charge. So we add up that, that's going to give this a net positive charge here. And for this, we'll have a negative formal charge here. And the net charge would be negative here. Sometimes we don't draw the brackets here and the net charge. Just draw the species like they did here. Um, well, here they drew the brackets here. They didn't draw the brackets here. So I think it's just that you would draw the brackets or you would not. All right. Now, um, you know, th this is just a crew, roughly, you know, four out of a billion. And so, is this a really significant reaction? Uh, it's only like four out of a billion water molecules? No. It's really insignificant. However, um, when we're thinking about water solutions, it, it, is, it is an important reaction you know, that takes place. <coughs> We have to consider it for all solutions. So let's take a look at, at this. Now, if I were to set up the ice table here, I have H2O liquid plus H2O liquid. Now, this is, let's look at this more quantitatively here. Uh, this is going to form hydronium and hydroxide. And these are liquids, so this we'll ignore out of the uh, ice chart here. The concentrations don't change, activities don't change here. But the hydronium does change, and the hydroxide does change. And so normally what we do is we assume, you know, we start off with nothing hydrolyzed. You know, it's easiest to do that, even though this is already hydrolyzed. I mean, this is happening. This is at 25 degrees C, right? And so the water molecules have already collided, they've already reacted. But for calculation purposes, we just kind of pretend nothing's happened yet because this is the easiest thing to do. So in other words, we reset the equilibrium to the, to the left. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out what is, the, uh, what is the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium and what is the hydroxide ion concentration at equilibrium. We only have to measure one of these. If we measure one of these, then the other has to be the same because the stoichiometry dictates it's plus x plus x here. And, uh, and it turns out it's easy to measure this. This is easy. Do you know how to measure? This is so easy to measure. We're going we're to do this in lab tomorrow. And uh, we're just going to use a pH meter to do this. pH meter. And that's going to give us the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium. Now, obviously, this is already reacted. Not to a, at the uh, room temperature. And so uh, with the pH meter, we're going to measure its pH. Now what is the pH? The pH is, uh, do you know, P, P is a, what we call a power function. And all power functions have the same <coughs> format. This is the power of the hydronium ion concentration. It's actually the negative power of the hydronium ion concentration. To get the negative power of the hydronium ion concentration, you just take the negative log of the hydronium. This turns out to give us the power of that. Well, um, from experiment, uh, we can measure the pH. And so if we take a pH measurement, uh, we get a pH of, in pure water, what is the pH of pure water? Seven. And it's actually, you're going to get it to two sig figs. This is two sig figs here because in power functions, the uh, number uh, preceding the decimal, this is a placeholder. It's not significant. Okay, these are sig figs here. So we, we got two sig figs in this particular measure. And so we measure a pH of 7.00. And then what we'll do is we'll just take the anti-log of this because the hydronium ion concentration, therefore, is going to equal uh, 10 to the minus pH molar. And so this would be um, 10 to the minus 7.00 molar. 
Now, when we do this in our calculator, we're going to come out with a coefficient. Now, the coefficient is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar here. This gives us two sig figs. Two sig figs. The 7 here is just a placeholder. This is a placeholder. It's a placeholder for um, the decimal because this is going to give us six zeros one, two, three, four, five, six, and then a one zero. And so we just move the decimal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so there's only two six things here. Molar. So if we know the um, from from measurement of this, this is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium at equilibrium, and therefore the hydroxide will be the same, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar, because they're produced in a 1 to 1 mole ratio here. We can get the equilibrium constant for this, you know, K. The equilibrium constant is going to be the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. Uh, divided by the activity of water squared. The activity of water squared is 1, so this is divided by 1 squared, basically. And, and that, and if we use activities, but um, we don't, we'll just ignore it from there. And uh, this K is given a, a special symbol. It's, it's KW. W stands for water autoionization or water autohydrolysis. Now, uh, we can easily calculate the K since we have the equilibrium concentrations. The KW is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. That's our KW. There's a PKW, the negative power, you know, or uh, we could say the PKW. You know, P, P is the power. What is the power of the KW? The negative power of the KW is 14, so the PKW is going to just be. Um, we could calculate it. It's going to be the negative log of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14, which is equal to 14.00. This gives us two sig figs here. Two sig figs in the power function. Sometimes it's more convenient to write power functions because uh, they take up less space than the uh, regular function. Is a PKW. We also have this, you know, since we have hydroxide, you know, there is um, the POH. So look, this is the POH would be just the power of the hydroxide ion concentration. The POH in this solution is, if we look at the power, it's 7. Well, actually, it's the negative power, so negative times negative gives us positive. The POH is 7.00. And this one, the pH is 7.00. And the same thing holds here. You know, this is just the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. And um, we can do the opposite. You know, when, when you want the regular function, we just take the anti-log base 10. So this is just 10 to the minus POH molar. And the same thing with the KW. The KW would be um, 10 to the minus PKW. You know, it's the power, the negative power. So we'll just put it in there. Okay. And so uh, we can uh, convert because there's going to be certain relationships here. And that is the hydronium times the hydroxide is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And so what we can do is we can make a little map for our calculations. These are the types of calculations we're going to do. We're going to go from hydronium to pH. To go from hydronium to pH, we just need this equation. pH is equal to the negative log of the H plus or the hydronium. And then uh, to go from pH back to hydronium, we'll just take the anti-log. So the hydronium is equal to 10 to the minus pH molar. And then we can go from hydronium to hydroxide. To go from hydronium to hydroxide, we just need Kw. You know, Kw is equal to the hydronium times the hydroxide. And this has to equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And then to go from, um, let's see, where else would we go? We go to hydroxide here. And to go from hydroxide to pOH, you know, it would just mirror these formulas here. Uh, just pOH is equal to the negative log of the um, hydroxide. And the hydroxide is the anti-log. 
10 to the minus p O H molar. Yeah. And then to go from pH to pOH, we'll, we'll take advantage of the power function relationship. That is, if we have Kw is equal to hydronium times the hydroxide, then um, we'll use the property of logs to figure this out because the pKw will be the negative log of the whole thing, which will be the hydronium plus the hydroxide. And um, when we take the log of a of this, what does what does that give us? Well, I'll just uh, distribute it out, and so that gives us the negative log of the hydronium plus the negative log of the hydroxide. Well, the negative log of hydronium is just the pH, and the negative log of the hydroxide is the pOH. And so the pKW is equal to pH plus the pOH, which is equal to 14.00, so we can convert from those. So these are the basic pH calculations that we're going to do uh, in this chapter. All right, uh, we know that uh, water is uh, not such a powerful acid or such a powerful base. Um, and much more stronger acids. So let's, uh, what we're going to do in this chapter is we're just going to focus on this type of mixture. The type of mixture we're looking at is this. We're going to look at acid and water. Acid and water, that mixture gives us this uh, K, Ka type equilibrium. We call this acid hydrolysis. So we look at acid hydrolysis, a mixture of acid and water. Okay, and the other type of mixture we're going to look at is base and water. Base and water is a base hydrolysis, which is given by Kb. So first off, we're going to look at um, strong acid. You know, if I have a strong acid, let's look at something like HCl. If I have HCl, a strong acid, um, <coughs> water is plenty powerful enough of a base to pluck that proton off. And so if I have a water here, like this, then um, that water, well, one thing is, this, you know, think of this as uh, delta minus on that oxygen. Over here, this is delta plus. So an acid-base uh, reaction is just a positive-negative electrostatic attraction. Um, first, it will happen here, you know, and then what I'll do is I'll just do this. What kind of bond is this? Well, what, what type of bond in terms of valence bond? This would be an S, and what's the hybridization of fluorine if you're to hybridize? Now, I know Petrucci doesn't hybridize with fluorine, but we'll just hybridize everything. SP3. SP3. And so this would be an S SP3 sigma bond. And then we have an SP3 lone pair here. That SP3 lone pair, again, gets pushed into this, knocks these out. Now, the difference here is, is this. Um, one of the differences is, um, this being a strong acid, th this reaction is much more favorable. In fact, this is much easier to do than water. So HCl loses its proton quite easily. Uh, what, what causes HCl to lose its proton quite easily? Normally, when we look at acids, we try to um, look at them in terms of how easily they lose their proton. Strong acids lose them easily. And so a strong acid, what makes a good strong acid is a weak bond. If this bond is weak, then it should lose the proton easily. So that's one thing to look at. And so this is why uh, if we look at um, HCl versus HI, HCl versus HI, which one has a weaker bond, HCl or HI? It turns out HI has a weaker bond. And it has to do with the size. I mean, ID is huge. And um, since it's huge, you know, the electron density isn't as concentrated. I mean, one way of thinking about this is if I look at the um, sp3, S sigma bond here between an hydrogen and an ID. We can um, look at the el electron cloud here. And this sp3 orbital is much bigger because you know, it's made up of um, you know, bigger p orbitals and bigger s orbitals. And then we hybridize those. In fact, we might not even have to hybridize ID because one, one reason we hybridize 
is to minimize the uh, repulsion. But since I need so big, it might go unhybridized. It might just be a lot more P. But you know, to keep things simple, we'll just hybridize everything. To keep it simple, because there could be a small amount of hybridization. So even with a small amount of hybridization, you're going to say it's you know, it's like the extremes that we looked at before. You know, you're going to say it's hybridized. Well, it's not 100% hybridized. It's not hybridized. Well, it's not 100% not hybridized. It's somewhere in between. So it's either way, we're going to. We're going to be. So what I do is I just hybridize it. Look, you know, for something like chlorine, for sure chlorine should be hybridized. It's a smaller atom. You're going to have bigger repulsions between the electron clouds. The reason we hybridize the sp3 is to minimize those repulsions between the electron clouds, right? But if you got a gigantic atom like iodine, then you might not have to as much. Okay, but chlorine, um, chlorine and hydrogen, you know, has the same amount of electron. Uh, two electrons in the bond, but it's, it's going to be a lot more concentrated. And what holds a covalent, what holds a covalent bond together? What holds a covalent bond together? Shared electrons. Not shared electrons. Is a shared electrons a force of nature? <laughs> no, what, what force holds electrons, I mean two atoms together? It's not they're sharing and hugging each other. It's got to be some kind of force. It's not London dispersion forces either. I mean, um, what's holding them together is, uh, you know, electrical forces or nuclear forces or gravitational forces. You know, is the gravitational pull between a hydrogen and a chlorine strong enough to hold them together? No. And so what holds them together is electrical attraction. There's electrical attraction between the positive nuclei and the concentrated negative charge here holds it together. And so here it's a lot less constant. This, this bond's much easier to break. And so this is why something like um, HI, you know, water comes along and it has a much easier time plucking the hydrogen or a much more difficult time plucking the hydrogen for HI. It's a much easier time because it's just, you know, there's not as much fight. You know, here the chlorine's going to fight for the hydrogen. Here, is iodine going to fight for the hydrogen? It's not, no, it's not as much, not as much fight, not as much tug of war going on. Because what's happening here is this: you know, this oxygen sp3 is coming in here and going to overlap. So you have two sp3s fighting. You have an sp3 on this oxygen here, and you have this sp3 on the chlorine fighting for this. Well, who's going to win? Well, it turns out the oxygen is going to win in this case because it's a strong acid. And up here, it's the same thing. It's even easier. This oxygen is a small atom. It's quite concentrated electron density here in this particular orbital. So we can see this like this. Actually, I should I'll try to drag this. Chlorine's bigger. Oxygen and fluorine are about the same size. Well, anyway, uh, so uh, it doesn't matter. HI, HCl, water has an easy time plucking that proton off. When water plucks that proton off, what are we going to form? We're going to form chloride here and H3O plus. All right, this, uh, this is a strong acid, um, meaning the base, like water, has no problem plugging that off. In fact, we say about strong acids, strong acids completely ionize or completely hydrolyze in water. Right. And so this is strong acid, so it's 100% ionized. In other words, we're going from stronger acid, this is a stronger acid, to a weaker acid. Hydronium is a weaker acid than HCl. You look on the chart there. Like that. Now, if we have a weak acid, it, it's a different story. In 
So um, a weak acid, well, let's take a weaker acid. What would be a weaker acid? What should be a weaker acid than HCl? Well, it would go in this series. HI would be the strongest, followed by HBr, followed by HCl. HCl would be weaker because it's got a stronger bond. HF. HF. HF should be weaker yet because HF should. Hmm? Yeah, it's um, yeah, HF has hydrogen bonds, but that's not necessarily the reason it's going to be weaker. The reason it's going to be weaker is because it's got a stronger bond than HCl. If it's got a stronger bond, then um, it's going to have a harder time plucking the proton off. And so for the strong acids, strong acids, um, hydrolyze completely. I'll put completely in quotation marks because we know that, you know, obviously the collisions, you can't stop the collisions and it can go back. Um, that is, a hydronium can react with the chloride and come back, but you know, that, that reaction, the backwards reaction, is so unfavorable. It doesn't really happen much. Weak acids don't hydrolyze completely. And so let's take a look at some weak acids. HF? Yeah. No. Um, H, well, uh, let me talk about uh, HF a little bit more. But before I talk about HF, let's look at a weak acid like uh, acetic acid or some other. Let's go, what other weak acid can we look at? Mm. Let's go with something like nitrous acid. If I have something like nitrous acid, um, what happens is the nitrous acid um, is going to put up much more fight. And the water isn't going to easily take that hydrogen. In fact, there's going to be quite a bit more struggle between nitrite and water for that proton. And so here, the nitrous acid this. Uh, the water comes along here. And uh, tries to pluck off that proton, but again, um, nitrite isn't going to lose that proton easily. And so uh, in this case, we're, we, we have a different um, situation going on. We aren't going to form as much, and so we'll have uh, partial hydrolysis or partial ionization. Not complete. This is what we learn in Chem 1A, partial hydrolysis. Weak electrolytes partially ionize or hydrolyze in water. And so that's going to form some HCO plus and some nitrate in, in this case. All right, so this is just this tug of war going on. Now HF is a strange one. HF, you know, HF turns out to be a million times weaker than HCl. And so let's, uh, let's talk. HF is a little more complex, a little more complicated. HF is a little more complicated because HF is, you know, approximately a million times weaker. than HCl. And so does that bond, um, it, does that mean the bond is a million times stronger? Does this mean the bond is a million times stronger?
Well, what's an HCl bond? So we'll just take a guess what the HCl bond is. Just in terms of energy. Wild guess. You know, just ballpark within a couple of hundred. Just take a wild guess. We'll guess. Uh, let's guess HCl is about the hydrogen Cl bond is. Let's guess around uh, 300 to 400 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Uh, and so um, does that mean HF must be uh, 300 million to 400 million kilojoules per mole? No, that's ridiculous, right? And so there must be something else going on. Yeah, no way. No way. Well, I mean, what are some of the strongest bonds you can think of? What's the strongest covalent bond you can think of? Uh, ni nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond, right? And what was that? About. Yeah, when you guys continue on in, in science, you, you'll have to memorize some numbers, you know, just some numbers as a reference point. Um, because not everything you can do qualitative. Uh, sometimes people want a little more quantitative. Um, Especially at, at talks, if you go to, if you're going to a presentation, you don't want to hear somebody say, "Oh, that's a really strong bond." You want to hear them say, "Oh, that's a really strong bond, approximately what you know, this many um, kilojoules per mole." Um, because when things get way too qualitative, um, it's hard to compare anything. And so, uh, there's no way uh, it's going to be this big. I mean, th this is just ridiculous in terms of bond energies go. Ridiculous. And so uh, what happens here is something called ion pairing. I asked you guys to review one page in chapter 14 about activity. Do you, do you have a chance to read that one page? It's actually one paragraph, chapter 14. And the reason why HF is so weak is because of ion pairing interactions. And that is, you know, when HF um, we'll do this as, uh, rather than uh, hydrolysis, we'll do it as ionization, which is the same thing, you know, because as hydrolysis. This is equivalent to, in fact, this is the shorthand way of representing this, HF plus H2O liquid. Because H plus protons can't exist alone. Uh, protons are way too reactive. Why are protons way too reactive? Protons are way too reactive because of their charge, charge to size ratio. There's a full positive charge on something the size of a nucleus. You know, atoms are much bigger. Atoms are about 10,000 times bigger than the nucleus. And so if you have a positive charge on an atom, it's, you know, although ions, ions are about half, ions are about half the size of their parent, but still, it's way bigger. What happens is that these two should separate off, and we should have two independent ions. But um, this is not what happens. What happens is it partially separates. There's a strong ion-ion attraction, so ion-ion attraction. And so they don't completely separate. And so that H plus is, or the hydronium is not free in this sense. Um, and so what we have is this thing's called an ion pair. 
plan here. This is, if you want to go back, this is in chapter 14, when we talk about activities. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, what happens, what has to happen is a second step has to occur to knock the, to break the ions free. This is why HF turns out to be a weak acid, much weaker than expected. You know, it should be a little weaker. It should still be a strong acid, but it's not. It's a weak acid. And so just partially. And so we just don't generate as much H plus in the solution. The more H plus we generate, the stronger the acid per mole, the more H plus per mole. All right, so we'll do some calculations here first. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. One example we'll do is, is this. Um, We'll do, uh, what is the, the pH of, um, let's do the pH of 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar HCl. Now HCl is a strong acid. Strong acids, what, what they do is that um, strong acids hydrolyze completely in water. So this, we could just draw this one way kind of arrow. There's HCl and H2O, this is going to form H3O plus and uh, Cl minus. Now, this one um, we give the K, and this is K for acid hydrolysis, we give it the KA. A stands for acid hydrolysis. The Ka for this is going to be the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. Here. Now we have a, a chart of um, Ka values in the book and also in the room here. If we go to the chart, let's consult the chart here. If you look at the last column on the acid, see Ka there. So, oops, I didn't do that right because I'm missing one thing. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, I was thinking Kw. This is not Kw. It looks like Kw. I'm missing the, the HCl molecule concentration. How many molecules are you going to find intact here? Now, if this goes to completion, you know, it should be 100% converted into the ions here. If it's 100% converted, then K should be infinity, right? because uh, HCl should be zero. We shouldn't have any HCl left. It should have all reacted with the water. Now, when we go over to the chart here, here we have it. We have the ionization or hydrolysis. It's written as ionization here because it just takes up less space. But in reality, it would just be hydrolysis. And then we go over to this column over here on the right. This column shows the Ka value. So what is the Ka value for HCl? There's no number here. Right? But if I look here, it says large to very large. Very large. So you know, for the strong acids, we're just going to use. Now I, I told you I don't like. Right? We don't like qualitative. We, we'd like to be more quantitative, right? What does very large mean? Larger mm -hmm. than one. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have, we're going to live with, um, we're going to live with uh, qualitative here. And there's a reason we're going to live with qualitative, because uh, something like this will fix in the end. There's actually a number for this. And we can actually calculate the equilibrium in this. But it, it turns out that uh, oftentimes we don't. Oftentimes we'll use these qualitative terms like very large or very small um, sometimes because uh, one reason we use that is this. 
When we have very large, we're just going to assume 100% reaction. And uh, that's the case. Uh, that's what you would do normally in a, if you were to reset. And so this very large here is code word for reset this. Which way are we going to reset it? We're going to reset it to the, to the right. And then we're going to let things equilibrate after that. And so um, the reason, ra rather than putting the number there and the number is known, is to get people to reset this uh, using another technique. Right? And so um, this means code word for 100% reaction. In other words, just go ahead and let it react all the way. All right, so um, we'll just start off here. It's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar HCl. So what we do here is this. When I see that, I already know, you know, the water's already reacted with this, but I'm going to pretend that nothing's happened to this, and I start from the beginning. So if I start with this 100% molecules, and then I let it react with the water, I'm going to assume that nothing has formed yet. So I have zero molar and zero molar here. And so the change here is since the K is very large, we expect 100% reaction. So I get minus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar and uh, plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And so at the end of this, I'm going to have zero molar molecules and it's all been hydrolyzed into ions. Here. That's it. Now, what is the um, pH? Well, pH is the power of the hydronium ion concentration. What is pH here? What is the power of the hydronium ion concentration? Well, if I look at it, here's the hydronium ion concentration to equilibrium, correct? It's a hydronium ion concentration to equilibrium. If that's a hydronium ion concentration of the equilibrium, then the power is 8. And so the pH is, well, we have two sig figs here. Is the pH 8.00? Is the pH 8.00? Well, do you guys know about the pH scale? Let's talk about the pH scale here. Uh, the pH scale in general runs from about what to what? Let's just do this side here. Thank you. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. Is that correct? Okay, and then um, here, uh, if we have pH 7, that's what we call pH neutral. pH neutral uh, means this. It means that the hydronium ion concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration are equal. Um, if we're above uh, 7, we call it a basic solution. If we're below 7, we call it an acidic solution. And so uh, 14 would be strongly basic. And then um, down here, you know, 8, 9 would be moderately basic or weakly basic. Depends on how close you are to 7. Are pHs above 14 possible? No? If you had a pH of um, 14, do you know what the pOH is? If we had a pH of 14, the pOH would be? It would be 0. 0. What would be the hydroxide ion concentration? Well, so if the power of the hydroxide is 0, that would be 10 to the minus 0. And 10 to the minus 0 would be? It would be 1. 1 molar. So is it possible to have a hydroxide ion concentration greater than 1 molar? Yes. Yes possible. If we had a hydroxide ion concentration less than one molar, um, that's possible as well. 
And so it turns out that it is possible to have pHs greater than 14, but why haven't you seen many pHs greater than 14? And likewise, a pH of 10 to minus 7 means, I uh, mean, excuse me, not pH. A pH of 7 means that the hydronium is 10 to minus 7, right? A pH of 3 means the hydronium is 10 to minus 3. A pH of 0 means the hydronium is 10 to the 0, which is 1 molar. Is it possible to have hydronium ion concentrations greater than 1 molar? Yes. So can we go negative pHs? Are negative pHs possible? Yes. Negative pHs are possible. In nature, the lowest pH recorded in nature was some kind of thermal hot spring. So the pH, I think, was negative 2.4 in some thermal hot springs, which, is, which was very acidic. This, that's natural water. Obviously, we could have unnatural water, high, uh, very low pHs in the negative, negative. And then, um, and so in other words, um, we're going from one molar uh, hydronium to one molar hydroxide in this range, but, um, but it is possible to go outside that range to higher concentrations. <coughs> and so these are pHs greater than 14. Is that true? What, is what I said just true? Let's The highest pH in natural water is 10.7, 11.8. Let's go with the lowest pH in natural waters. We'd have to find it. I'd have to find it. But um, I don't know. What do you think? Yes? Do you agree? No. So you might have done, did you do pH calculations in intro chem? If you did pH calculations in intro chem, you stuck between 0 and 14. You never deviated outside of 0 to 14. Is the reason you never deviated outside of 0 to 14 is because no other pHs exist beyond 14 and below 0? Or is the reason you never deviated from this is because they restricted the type of calculation you encounter? And the reason you never deviated is because they, they restricted it. They didn't want you to do Because you know why? Because as the concentrations get higher and higher, what happens? to activity, this kind of thing. What happens with as the concentrations get higher and higher, so this is a very low concentration, but as the concentration gets higher and higher, it becomes more reactive. What happens? What happens is um, ion pairing interactions become more reactive. Yeah, significant. And so we say, uh, yeah, HCl should ionize 100%, but okay, if I go up to one molar, right? Then I, I, uh, maybe I should start worrying about it. If I go up higher, let's see, go back to my, let me just show you. Um, if I go up to 6 molar, what do you think about the ion pairing interactions? At 6 molar, you know, the, the, there are a lot more ions in solution. The ions in solution are going to see each other. While the ions are positive and negatively charged, they're going to be attracted to one another. And so the more dilute the solution is, we say the more ideal it behaves. 
The more concentrated the solution is, the less ideal it behaves, just like gas is. You know, the higher the pressure of the gas, or the more concentrated the gas, the less ideal it's going to behave. Well, the solutions do the same thing. The higher the concentration, the less ideal, the lower the concentration, the more ideal. And you might be surprised about the numbers here. So let me show you some numbers. Concentration is uh, one factor that influences ion pairing. And what's another factor? This is why H half is a weak acid. The other factor is, and we don't see this with HCl, why is ion pairing an issue with H half and not with HCl? It's not because of the concentration, it's because of another factor. What's the other factor? <coughs> Not the electronegativity. Size. The size. The, the, the thing is, you, ha you have to tell me. This is a question that I give in Chem 1A. What's the electronegativity of F, fluorine? 4.0 fluorine steel. What's the electronegativity F minus? Is it the same, 4.0? It's much less. It's much less. The electronegativity is not a factor. It's F minus. It already has an electron. It doesn't want another electron, <coughs> does it? It doesn't. So electronegativity, what's electronegativity F plus? Is the electronegativity F plus 4.0? No, the electronegativity is way greater than 4.0. Um, and so electronegativity changes depending on the charge of it. And so there's there, the simplest tables of Pauling's, but there are many more tables out there, tables of electronegativity that factor in the charge and the number of bonds. And those are much more useful than Pauling's because they will give you much more accurate electronegativity. And so uh, it's not electronegative. It has to do with the charge density. And so let's just go back to chapter 14. You can see this in the table because in the table it's a lot easier to see. If you understand this one table, then that's all you need to do. Um, this one table shows sodium chloride is a solute. Sodium chloride should split up into sodium ions and chloride ions. And so, so in other words, if I have one molal sodium chloride, I should form two molal solution of ions basically, because one mole out of sodium ions, one mole out of chloride ions. But what happens is I don't get a full, unless I'm at infinite dilution. If I'm at infinite dilution, then it's going to behave ideally. It's going to split up into ions. But as, as, as soon as the solution gets more and more concentrated, then the ions see each other. And the ions can be attracted to each other, and we have ion pairing occurring. And so here, the ion pairing is minimal at 0 0.001 mole out. At 1 1,000, or actually, yeah, 1 1,000 mole out, um, we have minimal, so it's very close to two 
you know, when this splits up, but it's not too. But what happens as the concentration increases? As the concentration increases all the way to one mole out, you see this. This behaves as, as if sodium chloride splits up into 1.8 particles rather than two particles, which means that about 10% of these are, are paired. And so they behave as a sodium chloride ion pair, or you could have cluster form of the ions being attracted. This is going to reduce their effective concentration. This is the whole thing about the activity. Now, look at this. Magnesium sulfate should do the same. It should split up into magnesium and sulfate, two ions. So at infinite dilution, that's what it does. But when we get to one mole out, it looks like about 50% of these are paired. Why? Why? What, what, it was only about 10% of the sodium chloride were paired, but 50% of the magnesium sulfate are paired by one mole out. Why is that? Because it depends on the concentration and it depends on the the charge, right? the charge density. Magnesium and sulfate, these are plus two and minus two. What's going to be more strongly attracted, a plus one and a minus one, or a plus two and a minus two? Plus two and minus two. And so ion pairing is much more significant for magnesium sulfate than for sodium chloride. This is going to lower its activity quite a bit. And same thing with lead to nitrate. You know, when we assume, when we do our calculations, we just assume it goes to two, it splits up. Magnesium sulfate is a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolytes do what? They ionize 100%, right? They ionize 100%, it's going to form magnesium ions and? And so when we were doing net ionic equations, ionic equations is exactly what we did, right? But how accurate is that? Well, you can see, as soon as we get the one mole out, it's not very accurate at all. And so this is just showing it, lead to nitrate. Lead to nitrate should split up into three ions, but at one mole out, it splits up into 1.3. You know, what, what clusters, what interionic attractions. So this is what I wanted, um, actually it's more, more than, um, more than one paragraph. But uh, this explains why the value of I for, for this. What we can say is that each type of ion in an aqueous solution has two concentrations. One is the stoichiometric concentration. What we do in, in our class, in Chem 1A, um, for the most part in Chem 1B, is use the stoichiometric concentration. But is the stoichiometric concentration accurate? Well, what is the stoichiometric concentration? This is the stoichiometric concentration. We use these. We don't use these. We don't use these because it's more work and beyond the scope of this class. So two concentrations we work with, and it's based on the amount of solute dissolved. So the other is an effective concentration called the activity, which takes into account the interionic attractions. We don't use activities. We don't use the effective concentration because that's, um, that's the topic of the next class after this, so you can do more accurate calculations. And so when we're getting to concentrations up here, are these pH calculations going to be very accurate? Let's go to 6 molar HCl. What do you think about 6 molar HCl? Can we just go ahead and assume it's going to ionize 100% like this? Oh, I don't know. You know, we've got to start worrying about effective concentration rather than stoichiometric concentration, which is beyond the scope of is beyond the scope of this class, right? And so this is way beyond the scope of Chem 4. So in Chem 4, this is it. They don't want to go beyond this because why? It requires more advanced calculations. It's not hard to do the activities, actually. It's not that hard. But anyway, um, yeah, pHs can go up and below, but we got to worry. You got to keep the solution of dilute. If you keep the solution of dilute, then we're good with the stoichiometric concentration. You know, and so between one and one, maybe it's okay for um, for stoichiometric concentrations like this. So I'm not going to worry about it. And so are we good here with this calculation? 
This is a Chem 4 style calculation. In Chem 4, what's the pH of 10 to the minus 8 molar HCl? Well, the, it splits up 100%. So if it's 10 to the minus molar HCl, 10 to the minus 8 molar HCl, it's got to be 10 to the minus 8 molar hydronium. If it's 10 to the minus 8 molar hydronium, then the pH must be 8.00 to 2 sig fig because it's 1.0 to 10 to the minus 8. Uh -huh. So does that mean if you have an acid with a really low concentration, it's going to be basic? Uh, that's a good question. I, 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 I think so because do you see do you see any errors in my calculation? If you have an acid that's really dilute, it's really um, this, this is what moderately basic, slightly basic. Slightly basic? This it's going to be slightly basic. Yes. All right, so this is another thing you ignore. One, you ignore any pHs less than zero or above 14 in Chem 4. And two, you ignore that this is, a, this is a, what we call, chapter 16 is what we call multiple equilibria. A multiple equilibria is the start. In chapter 15, you had single equilibria. Single equilibria, you just have one equilibrium one ice table, that's all you have to do. Starting with chapter 16, we have multiple equilibria. That is, we have to worry about this, the Ka for HCl, and we also have to worry about one more equilibria, which is what? Would it be the Ka of H3O? No. Um, no. Um, do the water molecules stop colliding if there's HCl present? No, the water molecules never stop colliding. Um, we can't ignore that. There's still going to be collisions between two water molecules. And how that, this is actually wrong. I mean, if you put acid in water, the pH should go down. The pH cannot go up. And so this is wrong. But that's okay because they would never give you this problem in chem four because everybody would get it wrong. And so that's just to not give you this. They instead they might give you ten to the minus three molar. If it's ten to the minus three, then the pH is about three. Um, they don't give it to you because they don't want to do multiple equilibria in chem four. But in chem one B we have no problem doing multiple equilibria. Multiple equilibria is this. We have the H2O, H2O. These haven't stopped colliding. In fact, we know at equal, this was at equilibrium. You know, the initial equilibrium, before I added any HCl to this, the initial equilibrium was that I'm going to have some hydronium in here and some hydroxide in here. And the initial hydronium is going to be 1.0 times 10 minus 7 molar. The initial hydroxide is 1.0 times 10 minus 7 molar. And then what I do is I perturb this because the hydronium just changed. And so I'm going to perturb this by doing this. Do you see this hydronium here that I generated in this first step? I'm going to add that down here. <coughs> and so now I'm going to have some additional hydronium in here. And so this is going to be plus uh, this 1.0 plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And so what I'm going to end up with is a new initial here. The new initial is going to be 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And this is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And so, do you see now my um, ratio is screwed up? And so, if I increase the concentration of the products, Le Chalet's principle says it should shift to the left. And so, what's going to happen here is this. There's going to be a change, which is going to be minus x molar, minus x molar. And so at equilibrium, I'm going to establish a new one. It's going to be 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 minus x molar, and 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 minus x molar. And so basically what I'm going to do is from the HCl, I'm going to, do, I'm going to perturb the water equilibrium like this. This is called the Le Chalet's uh, 
type perturbation of Le Chatelier. And then just solve for x. Kw is the hydronium times the hydroxide. This still has to hold true because the water molecules are going to collide like this. And so what, what's going to happen is this. I'm going to have a, a um, higher concentration than 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium, but a lower concentration than 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium, somewhere in between those. And so solve for x. But if you recall, you know, I did the, that problem number 40 from chapter 15. Do you remember problem number 40 where we uh, had that two tank? Uh, the gas volume increased. We had um, let me just show it to you. I've got problem from number forty, chapter fifteen. Recall this problem, number 40. Okay, uh, we set it up in two ways. What were the two ways we set up number 40? Can you just, uh, just review that, uh, the notes on that? Let's see. There are two ways we set this up. It was the exact same problem as this. Um, except it, it's different. It's still a single equilibrium, but there was a perturbation to that equilibrium. This is multiple equilibrium because you know we had to figure out this one first and then perturb this one. And so number 40 would be from here down. We perturbed it. We upset the equilibrium. We changed the concentrations. And so number 40 is the same starting here. And so what were the two ways that we had um, solved number 40? Let's take a look at your notes and then come up with that. Did you find it? Did you have a chance to analyze number 40? We solved it. Basically, number 40 and all these other problems, I don't do is Le Chatelet's shift. Le Chatelet's shift is too much work. There's a map. It's much easier to do it the second way I did number 40. The second way I did number 40 was to um, reset it. And so I'm not, I'm not even going to bother uh, doing it the same way as we reset number 40. 
we just reset it from the beginning. And so what we do here is we just say initial. We assume that none of the water is reacted. If none of the water is reacted, then what we'll do is we'll carry this down here for the hydronium initial. And so we say this is going to be the initial. I'm going to stop doing it like this to spell it out. The initial from the HCl, in other words, the initial from step one, this is called step two here, is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And um, step one doesn't yield any hydroxide, so there's zero molar here. And then the initial from water, we assume the water has not done anything yet. And so that's going to be zero molar and zero molar. And so we just reset the water, like we did in number 40. And so, uh, I mean, we reset it like we did in number 40. And so initially, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar and 0 molar. OK, so all of this came from step 1. So we'll call this step 1. This will be step 2. The way we do the steps is like this. Um, the steps are going to be based on the K. You know, which one goes first? Does the water go first or the HCl goes first? The HCl goes first because the K is larger. We do the biggest contributors to hydronium in an acid solution. We do the biggest contributors base hydroxide in basic solutions. So KW is going to be a lot smaller than KA here, 10 to the minus 14. And then <coughs> we let the change happen. The change is going to be plus X now because we have no hydroxide. And so we got to let the water molecules collide. When they collide, they're going to produce hydronium and hydroxide. Now, this is, uh, this is Le Chatelet's principle in a different sense. And the different sense is we aren't going to produce as much hydronium. We already have quite a bit of hydronium in here, so we don't have to produce that much more to satisfy the equilibrium. Um, yeah. And so uh, you can think of this as more like a Le Chatelet's principle inhibiting the reaction because it should shift the other way. And so at equilibrium, we're going to get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar um, plus x molar. So we'll just say 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 plus x and then x. And so when I plug this in here, the math is a lot easier. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 minus x times x. This is equal to kw. The math is much easier. Uh, we can quickly get into quadratic form. This is going to be x where minus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 x minus 1 point, or actually I'm going to bring it to that side, so plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 is equal to 0. I, d I don't like solving quadratic um, by hand, so let me just go to the quadratic solver here. I used to have a calculator. I think we got to buy a replacement. So um, let's go to the quadratic equation solver. Unless somebody, does somebody have it? I don't know why this is so slow. Calculator.net. Let's try that one. All right. So A is 1, B is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8, so 1 B e minus 8. C is 1 times 10 to the minus 4, or 1 times 10 to the, yeah, 10 to the minus 14. So let's go ahead and calculate this. And so I get 2. Oh, I, I made a mistake there, sorry. This B is negative. That's why I'm getting an imaginary number. I'm still getting an imaginary number. I don't know how this is working. 
No math is fun. All right, we'll try this. Unless, does somebody have a calculator? Mm -hmm. Did somebody already solve it? have made a math error, algebra error here. Mm -hmm. Why do you have the, the C right there? Because it's only just, uh, yeah, it's just X. You just distribute the X. Well, because K daddy. K daddy is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. It's going to equal, I better do this properly. It's going to be equal to, um, Oh, you know what? This is where I screwed up. Do you see that? It's plus. No wonder. All right, so that's why I'm getting an imaginary number. x squared plus 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 x. And the plus 1.0 should be minus, right? This should be plus. Mm -hmm. This should be minus. That's where I screwed up. Well, oftentimes there's a quick check to see. I mean, if we're getting imaginary numbers, it's got to be something wrong with that. And so I'm going to go to here, negative, and we'll solve this. Okay, much better. Now, uh, we get two numbers for this. Um, yeah, the first number here, um, 9.51 times 10 to the over here times 10 to the minus 8. And the second number here is negative. Negative 1.05 times 10 to the negative 7. So um, which of these? Is it x1 or x2? Which one is it? it? It has to be x1. It cannot be x2 because if it were x2, we'd have a negative molarity for the hydroxide, which is impossible. And so it's got to be x1. And so x1 is um, 9.51 times, and so we just x is 9.51 times 10 to the, we're allowed two sig figs, times 10 to the minus 8. All right, so um, let's go ahead and plug those in here. So the hydronium ion concentration, I'll just continue it up here. The hydronium ion concentration is going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 plus 9.51 times 10 to the minus 8, which is going to give me 10.51 times 10 to the minus 8 yeah. molar. And then the hydroxide ion concentration is going to be 9.51 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And so this is the hydronium. This is the hydroxide. Okay, then we do our double check here. Our double check would just be to make, make sure that uh, our K comes out correct. So the double check would just be to multiply these two and see if we get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And so I'll do that right here. I'm going to take um, uh, 10.51 10.51 times 10 to the minus 8. times 9.51 times 10 to the minus 8. 9.51 times 10 to the minus 8 equals. We have 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. Is that what you guys get? And so this, this double checks out good here. Now, I, I just, um, you know, since I have the calculator, I, I just like to plug in A, B, C. But let's say you, you don't have the calculator. What should you do? If you don't have the calculator, then um, you can solve it by hand. You know, x is equal to the, the 
minus b plus or minus square root, etc. Or you could try some tricks that might work to simplify the math. One of the tricks that might work in this case to simplify the math, you know, for example, I might have not have to solve the quadratic by hand, is um, is this. You know, k is very small. k is 10 to the minus 14. If, if k is very small, are we going to expect much product here? No, because we expect very little product. And so if, if the change is small, you know, x should be pretty small, then uh, we could use what? We could use the simplifying assumption. So let's say I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, on a test, obviously you can't access the website. On homework, you can. You know, there are tons of them out there. Now, on on a test, um, you might say, uh, you know, I don't want to calculate the quadratic by hand. If I have to calculate the quadratic by hand, that's going to take like five minutes or something. And so you could try the simplifying assumption. And so let's see this. If alternatively, um, here, we, we went here, we're going to say, we're going to try the SA, simplifying assumption. If we try the SA, then KW is going to equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. And so we're going to say that X is so small, that it's going to be much smaller than 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. And so when I state the simplifying assumption, I'm stating that X is going to be much smaller than 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. And therefore, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 plus x is just 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. This would be like a swimming pool and then adding a drop of water. Here, I can't drop the x because, you know, even one drop is greater than zero. You know, zero is nothing. So if you're like on Mars and you find a drop of water, or not even Mars, on Jupiter or something, if you're on Jupiter and you find a drop of water, where else? You know, that's significant compared to zero. But here, we're just saying it's insignificant compared to this. And therefore, x is equal to, well, I could do this one in my head because it's going to be 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus 8, which would give us 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6. That's what our x would equal. And then we calculate the percent change. The percent change is the change, which would be x, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6, over the initial 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 times 100, which would just be 10 squared percent. So this is going to be 10 to, oh, this is going to give me 10 to the fourth. 10 to the fourth would be 10,000% um, change. Is it 10,000% change? That's, no. And so the simplifying assumption fails in this case. So if the simplifying assumption fails because the, the SA is giving us a percent change greater than, much greater than 5%, then we're going to have to solve the quadratic either by hand or by calculator. Um, you're going to have to solve the quadratic. Okay, so the K checked out. Now let's calculate the pH. The pH is going to be equal to the negative log of the hydronium. And so this is going to be the total hydronium. The total hydronium is going to, going to look like this. The total hydronium, there are two contributors to the hydronium here. We only factored one when we did the original calculation. We're going to get the hydronium from the HCl plus the hydronium from the water. The hydronium from the HCl was this 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8. The hydronium from the water is the x, you know, what we're getting additional. The x is 9.51 times 10 um, to the minus 8. So. This was 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. This was 9.51 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And so the total hydronium would be 10.51 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And so let's figure out what that uh, comes out to, the log of 10.51 times 10 to the minus 8. I get a pH of 6.97, I'm allowed 3 sig figs, so 6.9783 pH. 6.9783, is that acidic or basic? 
it's acidic and it's just you know this is just sli very very slightly acidic it's slightly acidic because consider the molarity of the HCl the molarity of the HCl is like nanomolar region micromolar would be 10 to the minus 6 nanomolar 10 to the minus 9 so it's getting close to nanomolar region so there's barely any HCl in here so it just be barely acidic and so this seems to work out okay. And so we're looking at multiple equilibrium from, from now on.